the name of it is Blossom. So it was the kind of um, quotes that they created. So yeah, we can turn it a little bit on the side. Is this the one? So that one's, I see that these are two different yeah. quotes. Yeah. Is it part of the series? Um, they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't create like that. Um, they don't create like that. They're still very active. story that goes with this particular quote? Not that we know of yet. If Spellman helps me to get to G's bed, I'll go, because she's still living. Okay, thank you. So this is, I think, as, um, and this is one of our friends. Yeah, yeah, this one came from the foundation. So um, the modeler is acting as a barrier layer for the object um, while it's in storage. It is particularly helpful with textiles when, it, when they first come into your collection because textiles are quite delicious to bugs. Mm -hmm. And while wrapping things in mylar once it comes in helps you see if there are any bugs because they can't get through that material. You can see um, them or their bodies or their droppings yes. and um, understand that you're, this is contaminated, it needs to be treated. And then once you see, like, okay, it's not then this can also act as a way to remove it from the box in one piece. So you saw when we took it out, we didn't really have to grab the object, we just grabbed the mylar and that completely contained the object. So in that case, when there is like, the bugs in the textiles or any other piece, how would you fix that problem? So it depends on the piece, but very often with textiles, as long as it's safe to, we can put them in the freezer. Um, a lot of bugs can't tolerate cold temperatures for long periods of time. So we would wrap it um, in a material that uh, protects the work in the freezer and then put in some layers to help absorb any moisture that might occur in the freezer and then freeze it for three months or so to make sure that any pests that are present are killed in that process. And if it's not something that's safe to go in the freezer, um, like if it's wooden, you sometimes are very suspect about putting things in the freezer because you don't want to cause the wood to expand and contract and create more cracks. Um, so then you would put it in an, an anoxic environment where there is no oxygen, and you basically slowly suffocate the bugs. Which, uh, part of our job is killing things, which is quite satisfying a lot of times. You don't want them there. <laughs> so then you just suffocate them over a week long period, and then remove all their detritus so that way you don't attract bugs that want to be with like You don't want uh, something to bring in, something that would eat your entire collection. Because that has happened to museums before where they brought in an artifact and didn't keep it quarantined and then found out that that has now disseminated a beetle into their entire collection. That particularly beetles are not very selective about what they eat. Um, so then you have to treat your entire collection that was affected and that can be financially overwhelming, or you may not have the staff to do so. So it's always best to think about quarantine things that potentially could have one. And cardboard is, is susceptible to that too, right? Yeah, um, particularly uh, silverfish mm. like to live in cardboard and eat cardboard. I so that's that. it's basically a hotel for them. <laughs> the only can eat buffet. So we try not to keep we try to use our cardboard cardboard, because particularly like just regular brown box cardboard is delicious um, and acidic, and so you don't want either one of those things near your objects. But the archival cardboards are not as uh, are not as good, so they don't they're not as interested in it. Um, so you can sort of eliminate them by removing food sources as much as you can. <laughs> This is actually a really good way to um, tag textiles. Okay. Um, so it's completely fine. Okay. Uh, I would just recommend, like, again, like stitch in the ditch, aim for a hole that's already there. Okay. So that way you're not adding a new hole. Um, but particularly with textiles, it's hard to keep 
tags with them if you're not going to sew it on. Because once you take it out, it's just a piece of paper on top that can float away, but it's, you have to either find that or find a way to reassociate it to its accession number. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of places do use safety pins to keep the tag attached to the works until they're ready to go on this one, which is pretty fun. What about consolidating this area? So here there's um, rough edges on the fabric, and so there's a lot of fraying, and over time or with too much um, handling or friction in that area, it can cause more fraying, and then it will start going over where it's already been stitched. Um, so it depends on, um, it would depend on what, um, what conservator is treating it, but some people would just want to do a small encapsulation with a mesh fabric um, that would cover that to keep it from fraying, or some people would want to put a very dilute solution of um, like a gelatin uh, just along the line of where it's already started fraying, so that way it's acting as a very slight adhesive there, and it's helping make sure all those fibers stay together, but it's not um, introducing anything. Particularly in textiles, there's a um, hesitancy to using solvents just because of how damaging they can be to fabric and colorings of the fabric, particularly if you don't know how it was colored or if the um, if it was dyed, you don't want to cause any tide lines or any um, disturbances in the colors that you have present. So in textiles, there's a lot of um, things that are done with water or um, done with just so if you are interested in textiles, you have to get really good at doing all kinds of stitches so that way your work can be blended in with the work that's already there so it's not distracting. So pristine environments, but not necessarily pristine artworks. Yeah. Yes. So the statue that we saw ahead in the Say that you would still take that piece mm -hmm. with this textile and this quilt. Like, if it was like completely cut up, you could see how the stuff in it is. Would you still take that? Or? That's a political question yeah. sometimes. Yeah, that's a political question. Because yeah. it very much depends on the piece. Because if it's, like, if it's, for example, similar to the head and ebony where the artist did that and that is now part of the work, then a lot of museums will still take that. But if it was, like if someone was angry at a museum and did that, then it may be difficult for a museum to accept that without um, someone being very inventive and correcting all that damage, or at least stabilizing it. So it very much Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you. No problem. <laughs> So um, we're almost at time, but you know where I live. And if you'd like to come see the Romeo Bearden, you know, please call me, make an appointment, and you can see the rest of the collection too. We're trying to make the collection more accessible because when we built, when the um, storage was built, it wasn't built for growth. So we're trying to mitigate that now, but you're more than welcome to see the works of, from the Spelman College collection. And thank you for your attention. So the duty of care, you know, and what we do has consequences. Thank you so much, Anne and Lestarcha. Um, before we congratulate them on a really, really exciting panel and also just the chance to actually see something um, from your collection, are there any questions from the floor? Yes. Um, so you spoke briefly on how the spot can affect the bus and the bus that wasn't there, on her feeling unrecognized compared to her male counterpart. I was interested in conservation work. Does racism or white supremacy do you ever interact with that or instances? Yes, not on an individual level mm -hmm. particularly. Um, most people in conservation 
are uh, more open-minded and more progressive and more sensitive to different things. Um, but systemically, yes. So for example, um, part of my fellowship at the National Gallery includes a long-term research project. And at this time, I was, I'm trying to have it focused on African American assemblage artists. Mm -hmm. And one of the first things you do when you start a research project is a literature review to see what other institutions have written about that work or if another conservator has treated it and written a paper on treating it, they found something interesting. And one of the artists that I started with is Betty Saar. And when I went into Google Scholar to, to start my literature review and I put her name in art conservation, I got zero results, mm -hmm. nothing. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have the background information of other people having treated them before and knowing what other people have found or other people have done because it just doesn't exist. But if I look up Joseph Cornell, who makes works that are similar to Betty Saar, um, and she was inspired by his, he makes um, Cornell boxes, what they're called. So they're like little um, shadow boxes for his art. And uh, it's all found materials. And she has incorporated that into her work as well. Um, I think I had at least 15 results of papers written on his work. Mm -hmm. And so then I started going through some of the art history uh, databases that I use. And one of the databases in Betty Sarr's section simply had a link that said, see Joseph Cornell. And so it was, it's difficult to find information and build off that information from our project because it's not there. It hasn't been done yet. And it's not that it was purposely done. It just wasn't something that was thought of at the time, that it was important, that it was given that, that value to be written about. There's also a cultural competency. Did you talk about the radio running? I haven't talked about reading okay. around. Um, but that, that we'll talk about at lunch. Oh yes, yeah. it's, it's a lunchtime conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I, I just want to maybe just add something to what you were saying about SAR too. Now that her archives are going to be housed at the Getty Research Center in Los Angeles, I think that I'm hoping that there are going to be opportunities for you to continue the work that you're doing on her work um, there, and that there are other opportunities through the many. Uh, retrospective exhibitions that have been staged of her work recently um, in New York and LA and other places in, in right. the US. So I'm, I'm planning to visit the archives and go through. She gave her entire artist archives to the Getty, and so I would like to go through that archives and see um, what information I can extract from it. And then she is still living, so I would love to do an artist interview uh, with her and ask her about her works, how she envisions the care for her works, how she envisions the life of her works, um, while we still can, because she's in her 80s, and so. She's about 93 going oh, on 94. Oh, she's in her 90s. <laughs> <laughs> but she's, she'll, she'll, she's 110%. She'll yeah. 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 About subtracting some numbers. Yeah. Um, but, you know, gather that information while we still have access to um, Betty now, instead of having to ask her daughter and get it secondhand. And, um, yeah, um, we just have to. All right. Looking forward to that. We are too. All right. So please uh, let's raise our hands and thank our presenters. And um, we're now going to a break for lunch. Um, just outside of the doors where Rachel and Lauren are standing, um, we have lunch for you. So please help yourselves and then come back in. This is a working lunch. Um, our next panel um, for the working lunch is entitled Becoming an Art Conservator. And we're also um, having the Emerging Conservation Professionals Network overview as well. So this will be a conversation that takes place between Shannon Brogdon Grantham, Lestarsha McGarity, and Ephronette Brown, um, who is an alumna of Spelman College of the class of 2009, and a conservation technician from Emory Libraries. They're going to share their personal journeys into the field of art conservation. I think you'll hear some of those behind the scenes stories about um, certain objects uh, that each of the conservators have had to uh, work with. Um, following the, the lunchtime panel, Caitlin Wright, um, who is the Atlanta Regional Liaison of the Emerging Conservation Professionals Network, will share opportunities to get involved in the ECPN. 
which is an organization that assists emerging conservation professionals entering or thinking about entering the field of conservation with the transition from pre-programmed candidacy to graduate school and through to early career stages. So um, please go on and get something to eat and we'll resume here. I also want to just mention quickly that we do have a hard stop at 1245. Um, so we just want to be mindful of the next hour and 20 minutes. And um, we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you very much. But the line is about two feet long. I mean, two hundred feet long. Okay. Let me move this. So I'm just trying to ask you, everyone. We're going to move into the lunch now. Okay. 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 Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to start our lunchtime panel entitled Becoming an Art Conservator Emerging and, and with the Emerging Conservation Professionals Network Overview. Um, I'm going to begin by actually reading the uh, biographies of our presenters. Um, I figured maybe some of you haven't had a chance to actually read them yourselves. Lestarsha D. McGarity is the Andrew W. Mellon Fellow in Objects Conservation at the National Gallery of Art. She um, received her BA in Art with a minor in Chemistry from Texas Southern University in Houston, Texas a renowned HBCU, and I just have to uh, give a shout out to her school spirit there, yay! Um, and an MA and a certificate in advanced study in art conservation from the Garmin Art Conservation Department at SUNY Buffalo State College in Buffalo, New York. Her bro program experiences included Texas Southern University, the Cleveland Museum of Art, the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture, and the Smithsonian's National Museum of Art. Her graduate internships were completed at the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum and the Museum of Mississippi History, the Brooklyn Museum, the St. Louis Art Museum, and the Academy of Motion Pictures Museum. Right? Museum. Okay. Uh, Ephronette Brown, um, who is an alumna of Spelman College, the class of 2009, is a conservation technician at the Emory Libraries here in Atlanta, Georgia. She was introduced to conservation at the Georgia Archives in 2014. Since that introduction, she has grown her skills and knowledge through hands-on training, meetings and workshops, and meetings and workshop attendance, excuse me, and an internship with the Atlanta Art Conservation Center. Ephrodette is continuously engaged and challenged by the work that crosses her bench and actively seeks opportunities for further learning and growth. She holds an MLIS from the University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa, Tuscaloosa, and is a 2009 Spelman College graduate, as I said before. Shannon Brogdon Grantham, um, who's also from the class of 2009, and I have to give a shout out again to Rachel Brown, who's um, I think outside, but Rachel is the class of 2010, so there's, there, there are some friends here in the room, and we're happy that they're here together and have all come together. Um, for the sake of art conservation. Shannon is the photographs and paper conservator at the Smithsonian Museum Conservation Institute. She's a graduate of the Winterthur University of Delaware program in art conservation, where she focused on photograph conservation and had minor concentrations in paper and preventative conservation. She holds a BA in art from Spelman College. Prior to her current position, Shannon was a Smithsonian Institution postgraduate fellow in the conservation of museum collections and was based at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. Shannon has held internships at the Center for Creative Photography, Paul Messier, LLC, Conservation of Photographs and Works on Paper, 
at the National Museum of the American Indian and National Museum of African Art, Southern Art Conservation, LLC, the Robert W. Woodruff Library at the, here at the Atlanta University Center, and Emory University Michael C. Carlos Museum. Shannon also has performed collection surveys and assessments of photographs and paper-based collections for the Longwood Gardens Archive and the Spelman College Museum of Fine, the Spelman College uh, Archive. She is active in her professional organizations and is a member of the American Institute of Conservation and the Washington Conservation Guild. I'm going to uh, introduce Caitlin Wright, um, who's the Andrew W. Mellon Fellow in Objects Conservation at the Carlos Museum here in Atlanta, and the regional, regional liaison for the Emerging Conservation Professionals Network uh, when she comes to join us uh, after the conversation that is about to begin now. Thank you. Particularly in uh, the historic building 
all the comes all the construction work that happened to that building to renovate it and make it work for the modern way that we function in office buildings uh, was done in a way that always that wasn't always the nicest to the artworks that were on the walls. So things that were happening on the walls on the opposite side, sometimes they weren't thinking about that there was art on the other side, so they caused some losses to the wall itself and damages to the paint. So I was, um, after referring to myself as their intern for about a month, they uh, asked me to be the intern, and I was able to work on a mural that didn't really need a lot of conservation, but needed some. And so I got to work on uh, this mural and then one on the opposite side by the same student, uh, who's Kermit Oliver. He was the Texas Artist Laureate, I want to say 2016, and is still the only American to have designed for Hermes. So he designs some of their scarves. Um, they tend to be of Texas wildlife and uh, flowers. So it's very really beautiful, they're way out of my price range. And so for me, this was um, like my first real like conservation experience, my first, I, Time to try it out and see if that was right for me, and it felt um, very know, like the beginning of something. And it was very much, I felt more connected to my campus in that way because I love Texas Loving very much, but I was very busy while I was there, and so I didn't really get to participate in campus life and um, really connect that way. But being able to physically care for the campus and all of the history of the students who'd come before me really helped me feel like my campus was my campus because I was able to connect with it in that way. Okay, um, I'm Ephraim Brown. I'm as data. I work at Amory Libraries, and um, my path is, is very different from the, the ladies beside me. Um, I'm a conservation technician, and I came through it being bench trained. I am still currently being bench trained. So the image that you see is actually from like last month. I'm treating um, a publication from the African American collection at the, um, the Rose Library. Um, it's called the Rare Books and Manuscript Library at Emory. And um, I put, I chose this image just because it's a current representation, current representation one of what I enjoy doing, which is repair, like you can. That is my hand, so I am I'm getting paste out of um, a, uh, a little little tray and repairing the um, a binding of the um, of the the publication so they can be resewn and still function and um, be used. So that's a big part of my job is taking things that um, have been either collected or used since I work on the circulating collection of the library as well and still make them useful. And I feel like. Um, coming into conservation from a digital um, slant and also from a library slant, it's very important that people realize that taking care of the physical item is also important to how you know patrons interact or, or future generations interact with something, even as something as um, a publication from a, a, a black community, I believe in Detroit, and they have a, um, a club world, was the title of their, their um, publication for the community. So it had different um, cotillion photos, you know, who's coming and going within um, that particular, particular community. And I really like working on the African American collection is because a lot of um, institutions that either collect from black life often um, don't feel like it's relevant to preserve or to rehouse or to really just take care of those collections. And I think it's very rewarding to work for an institution that believes that all collections should be um, preserved and conserved so this is successful. Questions? Questions? Do you have questions? Thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I had a student asking um, minutes ago, how, essentially, I don't know, how to make the most of your experiences, um, recognizing that you might not always be able to get into, you know, like a huge regional museum, right, or a Smithsonian museum, like maybe your work, your preparing work for the private conservative or the small archives. How can you um, kind of turn that or spin it um, in your applications to make that work for you? I have to say, so when I started out, um, of course, I had my first pre-program pre experience was in a museum um, setting. 
but when I moved to a region of the country that has even fewer conservators than there are here, I uh, was working with a conservator in private practice and just trying to take advantage of every single opportunity to learn something, whether it be you know color matching or she she had these clocks that she had been working on um, she, that were damaged in Hurricane Katrina, and so. I didn't, I didn't do any of the treatment on the clocks, but I learned all about in-painting and how she was selecting the materials to do the in-painting on them so they could be you know, aesthetically compensated and, and given back to the collection that they belong to. So I would say just taking advantage of as, as much opportunities as you can to learn something new. If there's a talk or some sort of uh, event going on in your city where it's, there's going to be conservative there, or even collections management. Taking advantage of what I call conservation adjacent opportunities can help too, because working with collections is such a specialized um, field. Whether you're a registrar, a curator, collections manager, conservator, you name it. It, and so having knowledge <coughs> about how all of those inter intersect in collections work can be helpful. So that's what I would suggest taking advantage of as much as you can to learn something new. And then I'd also say to in your application materials, mention that it was a smaller place and that you had to wear multiple hats. Because the National Gallery of Art is a very large institution. So I don't really get the opportunity to do any preventive conservation because they have a preventive conservation department. So that's someone else's job. But when I was at the Mississippi Museum of Civil Rights, they have one conservator. So anything that could be conservation related falls to her. So she was doing treatment and uh, monitoring the environment and doing the integrated pest management and doing rehousing. So all of those things were conservation related and I would just say to mention that in the materials that you know I was the, con the conservation technician for this institution and all of my duties included all of these different things and figuring out how to balance the time to do all of that while still getting, uh, keeping up with the treatment schedule. I would also say to, to Bob to continue to look also outside of your um, institution if you have the time to see, as um, Shannon was saying, what is adjacent. So saying you are um, working in a conservation lab at, at one institution, but there might be another institution that um, does something similar. See if you're just talking. Say one is paid and one is not paid. See if you are able to adjust your schedule at one location so that you have one day a week or maybe two days a week to work at another institution that just bolsters either um, what you're doing or maybe trying something new. I know that um, when I was working at the, um, the archives, I was able to do a one day a week um, internship at um, the Art Conservation Center. And so just knowing that I did have a full-time job and they were able to just make space for me that I was actually learning and expanding my skills and things like that. So it doesn't necessarily, if you're able, you can also look outside your institution to something adjacent. And, and if everyone knows that you're working towards something, they'll accommodate you as best they can so that you know, you're able to grow.
some of them would try, because I had mentioned that I was interested and that I'd already had some experience, they would try to connect me to other people whose contact information is not as easily found or who they thought might be a better fit for what I was hoping to do. Or they would just suggest, or they would say, well, I'll keep your resume on file, and if I have a big enough project, then I will um, give you a call. Where there was one where he mainly does outdoor sculpture, and you can't really do that in the winters. That's more of a like <coughs> spring to fall at most, um, depending on where you are in the country type of activity. So he was like, you know, if you're still available in the summer, I have no problem taking you on in the summers, but not right now. And because I put that I already had some experience, he felt comfortable saying, I'll teach you what you need to know for this specific thing, but I know that you already have some experience. So I'm not asking your knowledge to do the blowtorch. Yeah, I would say, uh, echo exactly what Lestarsha said, you know, just putting your name out there sometimes can make a difference. Um, at the Smithsonian, we get a, a lot of inquiries, and I try to respond to every single one because I know how important it is to hear something back, even if it's not positive. But just making sure that you are proactive and you know, just send out your information, and you never know who's in the back. Um, and even if they can't take you on as an intern, intern, maybe they can give you a tour, or maybe you know, maybe if they're having some event or something like that, you can go. Um, there's a number of ways. I think it, it can be tough to break down that initial barrier, but just keep trying and, and putting out those feelers. Yeah, I would say see if you have um, like local groups, like I know um, ECPN is gonna, gonna talk, but like local groups that are just interested in what you're interested in, usually they'll group, the groups will do the legwork, so they'll get you in the space. And then once you're in the space, you can have like a little face-to-face -face with um, someone on staff or things like that, and so you, that's where the relationship starts. Like, this is what I'm interested in. You know, if you have five minutes, 10 minutes, you know, I would like to sit down with you. Or like, please, can I have your card so I can, you know, contact with you in the future. And usually those particular face-to-face -face interactions do lead to them remembering you when your name comes to their email or, or things like that. I know that's different than cold calling, but, you know, if you if you have a group that kind of gets you in the door, that kind of circumvents the cold calls so that someone has an image of you when you write them, you know, to, to ask for opportunities later. Yes. Can I just add a note to that? As someone who's heard from some of you in the room and that's a lot of these calls, um, cold they may feel, but don't be shy about following up. Sometimes, and I know at our institution, we email you know, spam filter is vicious and I miss emails because they get sit aside and off. Sometimes I get hundred emails in a day and I just miss them. And sometimes I have every intention of writing you back until you talk about it. that you're aware of or certain kinds of um, objects, photographs, works on paper, um, 3D works that you would like to get your hands on to be able to think in a different way about the direction of conservation and the work that you do. 
wouldn't say there's a specific object that I would want to treat. I would say there's a type. I'm very interested in treating objects that are more history pieces than they are aesthetic. Like I really love being able to be part of an object's story and being part of the history that it's, it's acting as witness to. So um, when I was at African American History and Culture, a lot of the pieces were very meaningful and impactful because not necessarily because of the piece itself, but because of what story was associated with it. Where there was one, um, and it was the smallest thing I think I've treated so far, but it was just a penny. And a penny, a penny. And you know, that, that seems valueless to all of us. But, and it was dirty and disgusting looking, but once I'd done, once I started understanding the piece, I found out that it was a penny that had survived the Tulsa race riots and all the material on it were from the fires. Mm -hmm. And when this family left Tulsa because all of their property was destroyed, they took what they could find, and one of the things they could find was that penny. And so they carried it with them to their new home and then held on to it long enough to give it to the museum. And that, to me, was so meaningful. because You have nothing left, and you have to go back and look for change from your home. And keep this one kind of worthless thing and it acted as a witness to something that people often question it happened. But if you can say, well, there's this penny, we have evidence, then that to me is something that I would like to continue in my career of treating things that have that story to tell or a story to tell. So I, um, I have in my career at the Smithsonian had an opportunity to work a lot with the uh, National Museum of African American History and Culture, and so I was there as a as a fellow at the Hirshhorn right before the museum opened, and um, because there's so few conservators in the photo conservators at the Smithsonian, I was asked to work on these photographs that were being selected to go in the inaugural exhibition, and so that was my first time really working with the collection, and ever since then, I've taken every single opportunity when they reach out to me and say, we have this thing, before they can even finish their sentence, I'm like, yes, I will work on it, because it's, it's not only meaningful to them to have it preserved, but it's meaningful to me because it's our heritage, it's my heritage, and so just looking at the multitude of materials that they have in the collections, ranging, ranging from jet magazines that my grandmother had stacks of those in her spare bedroom that she tossed way before the museum opened. I'm like, we could have donated those to the museum. You know, that type of thing to these precious photographs, 19th century photographs of unknown African American sitters dressed in their finest. I mean, it ranges the gamut. And as much as possible, I try to work on that collection. Um, even if it's just to consult with them about something that they're thinking of acquiring or actually doing conservation treatment. So those are my favorite materials to work on. I would, I would say the same, keeping on theme actually. Um, when I was employed at the archives, the Auburn Avenue um, Research Library had a green book that is now on display at the um, African American um, and Culture Museum. And that was one of the first items that I treated and repaired. So. At the time, when I was given the assignment, it was just a run of the mill work to do at the bench. I did not know that it was going to be on display at the, the History Museum. So um, I, w I will say that um, that my treatment was, like I said, was, was very new. Luckily, I didn't have to do too much to it. It was just guarding the fold and filling in fills. But to see it on display and knowing something that, that I, had, I had touched and that I had repaired so that it prepared it to be on display so that other people can see it, which is mind blowing. And I actually got a, um, a chance last year to see it like in the museum and right there, in the undisplay itself. It's the best feeling. It was, it was, <laughs> it was very surreal to know that like, <laughs> I did that yeah. and other people um, will see it. So yes, I, I, I do think gravitating towards um, materials that um, are of a historic nature, especially like this black life in general, is just really important to me only because it's, it's so rewarding to, to see to see your work, to see that someone else is, gets to see it and also use it if it's you know in an archive or things like that. I feel like that's that's the best feeling of the yeah. world. To see it elevated, these yeah. things that we have often like seen as.
comic place. I always refer to the Jet Magazine because I, that was like my childhood was pouring through Jet Magazines. It's just like to see something like that on view at a museum, never would imagine in a million years that something like that, so commonplace but so important in our culture, would be presented as this precious item. Uh, because it is, it is a precious item. And millions of people flock to that museum and they've nonstop been sold out. I mean, it's free to get in the museum, but of course you have to reserve tickets in advance to go. And since the museum opened, they've had a hard time being, you know, sold out of tickets. So, so they crashed the website. Yeah, yeah. yeah the did. website, um, it was a, it's a branch of Ticketmaster was doing the tickets and they crashed that company's website because so many people were trying to get tickets. I have a question about your day to day work as an art consumer. So, is it equally part research and the techniques and science behind conserving your work, or is it what is the perfect world, my perfect day would involve me <laughs> sitting down at the bench with something that I've either done, that I'm currently doing research on or treating, you know, uh, preparing for exhibition or whatever. Um, at MCI, Museum Conservation Institute, my work is more research driven, so a lot of the time I am doing research, uh, writing publications and that type of thing based on the works that I've uh, either done analysis on with my science colleagues or done treatment on. But um, a lot of my day-to-day, -day, like the daily thing, like what I did when I was at work on Wednesday was following up on emails and the less exciting administrative stuff that I really wish I could push off to someone else. But in a perfect world, that is what you would, you would be doing, is working with objects and um, you know, being able to tell their story. Um, I'd say my day, so I'm a fellow at the gallery. So in the structure of our lab, I'm like a junior staff member. So my day uh, does tend to be a lot more object focused, which I find really fortunate because a lot of the meetings have nothing to do with me, so I don't have to go, which I appreciate. Um, so I, I've been working on a Donald Judd box. Um, so there are these cadmium red boxes that sit on the floor. Um, they sit directly on the floor with no protection around them from the public because that's the artist's intent. So they tend to get interacted with a lot, uh, to put it nicely. Mm -hmm. So there was, there was a lot of scuffs and dings and scratches on the piece, but it's going to go to another museum to be part of a retrospective of his work. So the bulk of my time recently has been treating that so that way he can go out on loan and talking with the art packers about how it's going to be packed, what materials are already in the box, because they the gallery tries to reuse all of its crates because they're expensive and um, it's very wasteful to throw them away. So they were saying, figuring out what box it could go in, what materials we wouldn't want near it, and um, also responding to things in the gallery. So visitors love interacting with things that they're not supposed to. So there's a lot of the guards saying that something's happened and then going out and responding to what happened and seeing it. It's something that is minor and we can deal with while the gallery is open or if it needs to be pulled from it, from the exhibit or dealt with uh, when there's no public or if the gallery has to be blocked off for a time. Um, my day is, is usually at, at my bench because I work for a library. Um, uh, the items that come across my bench are for use, so I repair circulating um, collection and what that means like anything that's in the library that's um, accessible to student staff. Um, or uh, faculty, so a lot of broken spines or um, broken covers, things of that nature. Um, I also work on uh, the rare collection, so rare books with the same um, issues. Um, I create enclosures, a lot of enclosures. <laughs> um, uh, preventive conservation was mentioned. Enclosures is a big part of that, of just housing an item, so that um, the contact, the, the human to human contact lessens. I do a lot of that, a lot of um, repair work as far as just um, if a publication has been stapled, um, staples are rusty, I remove them and then I just um, sew them back so that they're still functional, but they're no longer in contact with something that could harm them further. So bench work is a lot of my day. I think, sorry, I don't know if it's first. Oh, okay. You hit me. <laughs> you hit me a long time ago, so I was trying to let you Personally, 
think for me, after I'm finished with school, I'd like to start up my own like small art gallery in my community. So I was wondering, <coughs> like, gaining like a basic skill set in like art conservation, would that be something I should like like look into so I can like at least have like the basic knowledge for when I ultimately start my stuff up and have to handle art or question. Yeah. I would say yes, definitely. Like, even if it's just a basic understanding of materials kind of across generally condition issues that are common with different types of materials. I mean, if, depending on the type of gallery that, like, if you want to do more paintings, then you really want to learn about paintings and how they're hung and the types of frames that people can use for them. But if you're doing works of art on paper, you want to learn about the vulnerabilities of paper and uh, I'm sure in the gallery space, not everything will always be on view, but just like how that stuff should be stored. Um, and you don't necessarily have to do all of those things. You can work with a, a private conservator to help guide you on, the, on that. But just having a basic knowledge is, is always useful. Because um, you can look at something and say, that doesn't look right. Maybe I should have somebody come conserve it. And they just keep the AIC website, which is culturalheritage.org. It has a find a conservator function. Yeah. So no matter where you decide to set up your business, you can put in your zip code and it'll tell you what conservators are associated with AIC in that area. <coughs> so then you can have them um, on file as sort of consulting. Or if someone has purchased something from you and it gets damaged in their home, you can say, well, these are the conservators in the area. Contact one of them and see if they can treat it. Um, so that way you can just have that resource. And there's other resources on the website. So there's a, um, like a conservation wiki, which will give you the like, basics of what you can expect from a material or things you might see. So it'll say like, oh, if you're seeing a white haze on this, this could be a balloon caused by this. So you at least know what to tell the conservator so they know how, what to expect. And so just say, I don't know, there's something white. So that could be just the other. <laughs> AIC.org? So it's, uh, they just changed the website. Um, so it's culturalheritage.org. Gotcha. There's a lot of useful things on there. They have uh, handouts and things you can read all about different types of material specialties. And yeah. be a nice, like, primer for you. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was wondering how the hard and soft skills that you your own experiences um, have informed your work in the field and what you found that maybe like things that you've been able to bring to the field that maybe your peers um, who don't look like us um, have not been. I would say it does make me um, more gentle with a lot of my things um, and think about what they're being, because particularly in objects, a lot of the issues are what something is being stored with. Um, or if they're made of two things that don't necessarily get along. Um, so it's made to think about like, what is my jewelry box made of? Because all of my silver lives in this jewelry box for the most of its life, because I don't get to wear much of my jewelry. But is it in a safe environment? And so I think about, well, what is in there? And it makes me um, store them better so they'll last longer, and I can give them away to other people at some point. And then the clothes I'm still just as hard on, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, once I, um, I do try to, when I mend things, make my stitches more easily reversible so I can fix it later. <laughs> I've done too tight, too tight stitching before and been very mad at having to undo it. Uh, but, and it does make me like more caring of people and their, their objects because it's, it's always so nice to see the evidence of the human connection to a piece. And so seeing that in my work and then realizing that everyone's objects are meaningful to them, regardless of it's meaningful to me, has made me a lot softer to what like people are, are saving or are um, asking me about. Or like one of my uncles kept asking me about this uh, ceramic bowl that he got from Target 
like 10 years ago and had dropped it and broke and he was like, well, how do I put it back together with adhesive? And I'm just like, go buy another bowl. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a you know, $2 plate you got from Target. <laughs> then it was like, oh, that was a bowl that one of his grandkids had gotten for him. And I was like, oh, well, that's why you asked me about it. It's because you want like, to keep that specific bowl and that specialty. <laughs> so then, like, over Christmas, I was able to put it back together for him with uh, good old Coop 2 with 72 <laughs> And um, so that way he could have that bowl because I didn't think it was important because I was like, it's just a target bowl. But I was like, oh, wow, like, that's important to you because of its context. And I'm, I was able to care for it for him by stepping outside of my own, like, it just came from target bias and, like, understanding that it's relevant and important to him. And things that bring to the field that I don't think I I would say cultural competency. Um, <laughs> and it's not, it's not uh, to say that, like, anyone has failed. It's just sometimes, it's, if it's not your culture, it's just something that doesn't click. Or when I was at African American History and Culture, one of the conservators was treating Radio Raheem's radio. And one of the stickers was kind of hanging off. And she was like, well, is the sticker original? Does it need to go back on? And I was like, what do you mean is it original? Like, yes, that's the sticker that belongs on there. And she was like, well, how do you know? And I was like, because it's Radio Raheem. <laughs> <laughs> she was just like, who? And I was like, Radio Raheem? Like, is it joint? She was like, <laughs> no, not joint. Like, oh, I was like, okay. Like, you have homework now. Like, you need to go home and watch do the right thing. And then see if, if your grandchildren tell them they can't be in the room because there's a lot of cussing, but like, you got to see do the right thing and like, you need to watch the movie. And then she was like, well, I think this is battery powered. Do you know what kind of batteries? And I was like, 20 D batteries. Like, you need to watch the movie. <laughs> because you don't have the context. Like, you, you just, you've never seen it. And it didn't occur to you to see it because it wasn't something that you felt related to you. But it was, as soon as I thought, I was like, yeah, this video was a movie. Like, you know that. And then she was like, oh, there's inscriptions on the back. Who are, who are these people? And I was like, that's Spike Lee, and like, that's the actor that was this person. <laughs> and she was like, well, it says, like, Raheem lives forever. And I was like, yeah, because he dies in the movie. Like, sorry, spoiler, but, like, you got to watch the movie. <laughs> but she was, like, it just, you know, she's a 60-something old white woman. Like, it just, that isn't her, her forte for things to watch. So she thankfully went home and, like, watched it that weekend and understood the piece better. But if if she hadn't ever treated that piece, I don't think she would have ever watched Do the Right Thing. I mean, just, just an aside, this is probably, hopefully it, it, it is answered your question, but I would say like um, in conservation, a lot of like pest management and environment control is a big part of it. And once, the more I got into the, um, uh, conservation, I just realized like, different ways that you can keep pests out of your home <laughs> and how to like manage those things. Like I said, I'm sorry, this is so weird, but like the aspect of how light, sometimes light draws insects to your home, something I never would have thought about. So I, I used to um, have like turn my light off over my stove, I stopped doing that. And I actually saw less, you know, blood activity as far as like outside bugs entering into your home, things like that. Um, also just like what your environment is like. Um, and pests don't like colder environments. I do keep my, my home a little bit colder, um, I like all year round. And again, I have seen like, not to say I have like bugs to work, but we do live in Atlanta. We do live in the South. So it's just kind of like those type of things as far as like my work environment, what I brought home. Um, as far as like, I mean, I feel like it's very important just to know, just to know that you are enough. Like whoever you are, um, you know, everything that you bring, your ego to receive, your anxieties, like your um, your knowledge and things like that, you bring that to work every day and I feel like you should fully bring your whole self to work. And you don't know um, what being yourself will do for people around you and also how you interpret different things. So never feel like you don't have an experience that can contribute to what you do now. Um, previously, um, as I said, my, my um, path to conservation was very different, but I was able to manage people in previous positions and that influences how um, right now I do student training within the conservation lab because I have that experience of knowing how to um, to manage people. So even though it's not conservation um, 
directly um, conservation related, it is something that was a skill that I learned previously that I bring to my work you know, every day. So I would say, you know, you are enough, like your whole day, like your whole self is enough to bring to work with you every day. So I think um, for me, I, uh, I like to collect, uh, of course, like I have a lot of photographs, but I've been kind of taking the charge of uh, keeping family photographs and photo albums and that type of thing. So, of course, I'm definitely much more aware of what these objects are and why they're important, but um, how to make them accessible to other family members that might want to have some images from them. So sharing digital files of things or making scans and printing them out and doing that, um, as well as like how I display works of art in my own home, selecting proper framing materials and mat materials and making sure that, you know, I typically don't cut my own mats for stuff at home, but um, knowing when I go to the art store to say, I want this type of mat, this particular one, this particular brand, because of th these reasons, um, knowing that. And then echoing exactly what Fernanda just said about bringing your whole self, like that is something that, um, it took me a while to, I think being in this job that I'm in now, I feel that I, I feel that confidence. But before um, just coming out of school and feeling like I wasn't necessarily in the best environment um, or I didn't necessarily feel like it was the most inclusive environment, it was really hard and I, I, I reached this point where I was, I didn't, I, I, I wasn't sure if I was even doing the right thing anymore, but it took, you know, leaning on my friends and colleagues who look like me and friends and colleagues who knew, you know, knew me before I started uh, grad school, having that support and having that network, but, but remembering, yes, that you are enough. I mean, whether or not you go into conservation or whatever field you go into, you might end up being the only brown person in the room. And recognizing that if you are, that's okay. You have a lot to, to offer and you have a lot to bring to that table. Whether or not someone wants to hear your voice, you make your voice heard because what you have to say is valuable. something that's really special to you, like a, say a photograph of your great grandmother, you know, that's the only photograph that y'all have of her, and it's been on display for however many years, maybe making a digital facsimile of that image and framing that, and then when there's some sort of family gathering, bringing the original out to share with the family, you know, something like that. Small changes, but I, I, I'm always an advocate for people living with their collections. I, um, I sometimes lecture to a group of uh, emerging art, African art, art collectors, and that's the one question they always ask me is like, well, how can I balance the preservation of this? But I still want to, you know, I just spent all this money on this thing, I'm going to live with it. And it's like, there's only so much you can do. Um, but if you have something that's displayed in a room that gets a lot of sunlight, maybe moving it out of area where it's getting direct sun and into an area where it's not getting direct sun. Like little things like that. And then, sorry, the QR um, storing things to try to get the best quality materials you can. Um, there's always going to be budgetary constraints and archival materials are kind of expensive, but just choosing the best that you can within your budget. Um, so a lot of my family's photographs are in like archival binders leaves that are meant to hold photographs or like playing cards if they're the right size um, because the plastic is supposed to be a better quality 
but we can still see them and then people can come and like flip through our photographs without having to handle each one. Um, but, and they're not that expensive. I think you can get a box of 50 for like 10 bucks. Um, and then I'll like try to wait till like back to school time and get them on, on sale. So that way we can get a bunch of them for a lot cheaper. We can just share them among the family so people can keep it in better materials. Cause it's always sad when like you try to do the right thing and store it away from the light and interaction and then find out that the way you store it is actually what damaged it. So just try to choose better materials. Don't store things in the basement or the attic. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. In the first place, if you have like a linen closet and you have like a box, a small box of things, that's a, you can just store it in there with your towels because the towels will absorb moisture and that's often a good place to keep things. Um, thank you. Um, and my second question pertains more so to your work environment. I've been thinking a lot about like news around preparators lately and just like all the dangers and just how they're treated in terms of their work. Um, and so it made me kind of think about how you all are treated like outside of your own labs and departments. What are your interactions like with curators or exhibition coordinators? Like who do you interact with the most? And also like how do you like to be treated and what are some issues that you may have run up against from other people in other departments that you feel um, like upcoming conservators would be interested in knowing as they enter the workplace. I have to say in my work, because because I work at a research facility, which I like to think of as this kind of neutral place, I don't work for one particular museum, so a lot of times I'm interacting with someone different at each one, so I might, at one museum, interact with the, with the curator, and another interact with the collections manager. Um, I, sometimes it can be difficult because there's the museums, every place has its own institutional politics. And so navigating that can be challenging sometimes. Um, I found that when I was first starting in my job, I um, just really trying to understand exactly what it is that they wanted me to do yeah. and, um, or what it is that they were trying to achieve. Like there was an exhibition, they wanted to display something a certain way, but maybe the artifact can't really handle that having that, let, letting them have their, you know, tell me what they want, and then trying to find a solution that would kind of split the difference. Like, it's not gonna harm the object, but it's gonna allow them to have the display that they wanna have. So that's just one thing, because a lot of times the, the rifts in conservation come up with how things should be presented in, in museums, and, or if something's even stable enough to go on view. And so there was one artifact that I had, had to uh, treat, and it had this very large uh, orange stain on it that I knew was a chemical stain that could not, there's nothing I could do about it. Um, if it went on view, it would get worse, potentially. And so I talked to the curator, and I explained to him, I was like, you know, this piece, I think it was very important to your show. Um, is there some way, do you have a, an alternate piece that will still tell the same story? Or is there a way that we can make a facsimile of this piece so this doesn't go on view? Because if it does, it could get worse. And once I explained that to him, he's like, oh no, we, we can take this one out and we can find something else. So I think just being able to communicate your concerns or whatever it is you're trying to say effectively after you've really understood what it is that they want you to do. Um, at the gallery, I, I tend to interact most with the guards because they are always letting us know if someone's interacting with something or if, if they feel like a piece has changed because um, they spend the most time with the works, and so they are an amazing source of institutional knowledge, and they you know, often find favorite pieces of, of art, and if they look at their favorite long enough, they'll say, oh, there's a thing there that looks new to me, and I don't get to see it as often as they do, so I can, they'll come tell me, like, oh, this has been damaged, and then we can look at it and see, has it been damaged, and is it, if it has been, is it something that we need to take care of now, or is it okay? Um, and behind that would probably be the curators. They're very interested in what's going on in conservation, and they have to, they have a large say in what's happening. Um, so they come down to visit the works, um, often throughout the treatment, to kind of work with us to see what exactly they're trying to achieve, and what we're able to achieve. 
say issues that I run into in the gallery. I am the first uh, black objects conservator to be there. So it was a struggle for people to understand that I was a conservator and that I was supposed to be doing that. Where even for orientation, like they almost sent me to the wrong room because our guard force is predominantly black. And when I showed up to say like I'm here for employee orientation, they're like, oh, the guards are down there. And I was like, okay, but that's nice. Um, like I'm not here for guard training. And they're just like, oh, oh, you're the. And I was like, yeah. Surprise. <laughs> 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 Star shows me everything. So it was like hard to get people to understand that. And then as I was meeting people in different departments, they kept just being like, you're in conservation? And I was like, no. I just like to hang out down there. <laughs> like, so that was a struggle to like get people to recognize that like other people work in conservation. Um, but beyond that, I found that although I was worried that the environment at the gallery would be kind of difficult because it is kind of staunchy old people kind of museum. It is. We looked at our demographics. We've got, like, got old guys named Bill. That's, that's our demographic. Um, so I was worried that that would like carry into the, the staff and that I would face problems with that, but everyone seemed to be really excited once I got them to understand my position. And uh, there, a, lot, a lot of people were very welcoming. And the people that weren't are like 80. So, I can't believe them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, do we have time for uh, uh, Just uh, to, be, to be quick, um, but my workspace is very collaborative only because, um, like I said, the items we treat are usually for use of some sort. So um, either the head of the collection or the curator of that collection. I'm, all, I'm really bad at the titles because Henry has a lot of libraries and a lot of you know different levels of, of management. but. Um, we usually come in as if just an uh, open discussion of, okay, this is what you want, this is what we can do, you know, how about we meet in the middle, as Shannon was saying, meet in the middle so that it serves the purpose that you want it to have, but also it's not worse for wear once it's, you know, once it's finished. Um, as far as how I'm being treated, I love my work environment. Um, I am the only black person in my department, but it, it very rarely comes up as a, as a sticking point in any, any way. Um, and that's, that's kind of what I meant to bring, bring your whole self to work as well. Like, just because I am um, a black person in a predominantly white environment doesn't really mean anything. You know, we find um, common grounds, or we also have very um, wide discussions of how my experience growing up is different from um, the women in, in, um, in my lab. And that's also a age gap, which is another um, way of diversity and things like that. So it's just, um, I'm, I'm treated very well, and just also just don't be afraid to have like hard conversations with a coworker that's not like you, because oftentimes they'll be informed by by your um, point of view, and you will probably learn something from their point of view as well. I'm also the only black conservator at the Smithsonian, so yes, I do understand working with people who don't look like you and have that age gap. Yeah, most of my colleagues at NCI, there's three conservators who've been there for 30 years. Like they started there when I was born, like the year I was born. So. It was, at first, I thought it was going to be tough working with them, but they welcomed me with open arms. So. Thank you so much, all three of you, for sharing your experiences about becoming a conservator and also for really touching on topics that are so important for our students and our faculty and our invited guests to, to know about with regards to this field and how it is changing and it is being changed by the work that you are doing. We're so thankful for the time that you've spent with us today. I'd like to now invite Caitlin Wright to join us here. Caitlin is an Andrew W. Mellon Fellow in Objects Conservation at the Carlos Museum and the Atlanta Regional Liaison of the Emerging Conservation Professionals Network. And I should say she's the Andrew W. Mellon Advanced fellow in objects conservation at the Carlos Museum. She recently graduated from the Garment Art Conservation Department at SUNY Buffalo State College, and she was a classmate of Lestartia's. She completed internships at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Athenian Agora Excavations, and
and the Institute for Aegean Prehistory Study Center in East Crete. Caitlin earned her BA in Art History from the George Washington University in Washington, D.C., completing pre-program internships at the Hirschhorn Museum and the Smithsonian Castle. Thank you so much, Caitlin, Thanks. for joining us. First, I'm just going to give a brief introduction to what ECPN is um, in general and then speak to more Atlanta area and how you can get involved. Um, so ECPN is a network within the American Institute for Conservation that maintains a forum and network for AIC members who are entering the field of conservation. This includes undergraduate students, pre-program individuals, um, graduate students, recent graduates, and early career professionals. So, of people. Um, we also advocate on behalf of and support the inclusion of emerging professionals within AIC by enhancing ways to serve members who are just entering the field of conservation and help members as they transition from student to conservation professional. Um, the community provides educational and professional development opportunities for emerging conservation professionals in addition to fostering communication between emerging and experienced conservation professionals. So I'm just going to bring your attention to some resources on the internet that can be helpful. Um, ECPN has a subsite on the AIC website that centralizes information about ECPN and the committee, including the network's history and past committee members, and details the network's programming and resources. And all the different resources you see here are included on the website. <coughs> ECPN also has an online community that provides space for ECPs to share resources, seek um, information and recommendations, and learn about exciting opportunities in the field, including lectures, potential fellowships, blog posts, and ECPN programming. Um, the general ECPN community is open to everyone, both emerging and established conservation professionals, um, including non-AIC members, and like I think Lestarcia mentioned before, um, you can create an account on the AIC website and be able to post without actually um, having to pay for a membership to AIC. And then the AIC wiki was also mentioned before, um, and ECPN has a subsite on this wiki page. Um, additional content can be added at any time, so check back in to see new content. Um, new content was recently added for um, conservation on social media, resources for emerging conservation professionals, and getting started in conservation science. Um, and it also offers a myriad of resources on starting up in conservation, so choosing a specialty, um, work on resumes and CVs, um, your portfolio, presenting talks and posters, and other things like that. So if you're interested, be sure to check that out. Um, ECPN has a strong social media presence, so they're active on Facebook with almost 6,000 members, so you can like um, the website and get connected that way. It's, there's people posting all the time about different opportunities and events. Um, and it's a good place to find information, but also casually uh, ask questions to the larger conservation community. So ECPN also holds two web webinars each year through the GoToWebinar platform, a program that enables audience members to engage with the presenters and ask questions in real time. Um, while ECPN strives to tackle subjects that speak to the personal growth and career development of emerging conservation professionals at any stage, the subject matter is sometimes geared um, specifically to pre-program candidates or graduate students or postgraduate students, so it's always varied. Um, and upcoming webinars are advertised via email, Facebook posts, and announcements on the AIC blog. Um, Here's the most recent webinar, which was hosted by Anisha Gupta and Leslie Gatt on navigating the workplace and harnessing 
community as an emerging conservation professional. You can check out this webinar and all the webinar content on the AIC YouTube channel. Which brings me to more information about the YouTube channel. Um, the officers have compiled their favorite conservation related videos and created a list so you can go see that video content on their YouTube page which as you can see offers a range from different museums or different professionals in the field. Um, and the liaison program, um, it continues to grow and foster a supportive community for ECPs. There are four groups, regional liaisons, graduate school liaisons, and specialty group liaisons, as well as committee and network liaisons. Um, so the new initiative of the specialty group liaison highlight series, um, specialty group liaisons are invited to answer a few questions about their specialty in a short post on the online member community. So you can check that out on the ACPN online member community. Um, this information can be found on the programs on the ECPN subsite under programs including liaison names, position, contact information, and vacancies. So this is a map of where each um, regional liaison is located, and there are 17. We're always looking to expand um, to different locations. And highlights, as in like what we do here with the Atlanta ECPM group, can include lab tours, resume reviews, and portfolio days, museum tours given by fellow ECPs, um, discussion sessions, and social events, which are all um, organized by the region regional liaisons like myself. So if you're interested in joining, all you have to do is give me your email address, and I'll add you to that list, and then you'll get updates about what's going on in the Atlanta area. You don't necessarily have to be entering conservation. You can be just in the museum profession and want to join these events and come see lab tours. It's a really great opportunity to meet people in the Atlanta area. Um, so I have a card, and you can come get it from me if you want. Um, there are also graduate school liaisons um, for each of the conservation and historic um, preservation programs that Lasarcia mentioned earlier earlier in the United States and Canada, and they're there to field questions about the application process for um, each of those programs because they're a little different, um, as we've talked about. Um, in addition to regional and program-related liaisons, there are also 10 for each specialty group, um, which are listed on the left, and 70 commi seven committee and network liaisons, which are listed on the right. Um, these li liaisons are more interfacing and geared towards the internal AIC community. So, should I let them in? <laughs> <laughs> January 2019, ECPN and the Conservators in Private Practice, CIPP, are piloting a mentorship program for emerging conservation professionals who have recently started or plan to start a private practice. And then the other mentorship program is between ECPN and um, the HBCU mentorship program, and it's in its third iteration. Um, this program connects undergraduate students or recent graduates who have participated in Winterthur's uh, TIPC, which involves the Tuskegee um, Diorama Preservation Project, or Yale's HBCU Summer Teachers Institute in Technical Art History programs with emerging conservation professionals who have volunteered to serve as mentors. So the goal of the program is to pair students with mentors who can provide guidance as they consider potential career paths in conservation, museum studies, or related fields. Um, and the mentors will be able to speak with their mentees about long-term professional goals, help them achieve short-term goals, and connect them with resources. Uh, please reach out to the ECPN chair, Eve Mayberger, if you're interested in learning more about their mentorship programs. She can be reached. I think there are cards out on the table along with those other um, resources that were mentioned before, and you can contact her through that email address. Um, so how to get involved locally. Um, you can follow ECPN on the AIC member community of Facebook. You can watch the ECPN webinars and other content on the AIC YouTube channel. Um, sign up for the Atlanta 
uh, list through me. Um, you can get involved in a local way by cross-registering for one of Renee Stein's classes. Renee is the chief conservator at the Carlos Museum, and she teaches issues in conservation of art and cultural property and technical art history. Um, you can learn more about cross-registration at the Atlanta Regional Council website, and Renee is here, and I'm sure she would welcome any questions about that if you're wondering about that. And then also local to Atlanta is CIRCA, the Southeast Regional Conservation Association. The major focus of CIRCA is to educate caretakers of cultural property and their communities about preservation as an ongoing responsibility, as well as to raise awareness and support for conservation. CIRCA has an annual meeting, which you can learn more about at their website, as well as joining if you're interested. So thank you so much to the AUC organizers and ECPN officers for organizing this event, and please feel free to reach out at any time.
And it looks to me like you all actually have heeded my suggestion to get to know one another at, at the tables. And I really would hope that we can all leave here, not just here, because we're all going to leave here together and walk over to the Clark Atlanta University Museum, um, but to leave here and with, you know, with someone, someone's card or email address or you know, Instagram feed so that we, we get to continue these conversations. I don't know if there was a question here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I stay connected with these folks through email and social media. I mean, we're friends on social media and we're friends on social media. So, yeah, so I, that's how I stay connected with people on that level. But of course, like mentors and people who are a little bit more senior uh, email or seeing them at conferences. Because uh, we always have an annual meeting for the American Institute for Conservation. That's kind of like a reunion for people who. They've gone to grad school together and haven't seen each other since they graduated. So that's that's how I do it. Okay. And, and I guess another way to ask, well, this is the question, is this a model for um, ECPN or for AIC in terms of thinking about um, the kinds of programs that you have throughout the year, um, the way that you connect people who are like the students in this room who may be interested in pursuing um, a conservation career? Is this a model for the kind of program you might have? Is this something that we should make an annual AUC Art Collective ECPN collaboration? Yeah, I mean, I think it's always great to reach out as early as possible. Um, and I think AIC and ECPN are always looking for new ways to connect on that level. Um, and this is great. Um, and I think AIC is always trying to develop new ways, um, like the Untold Stories um, panel. Um, to reach people at all different levels, so, yeah. Great. Oh, can I add to that? Thank you, Renee. Um, yes, I think that the career, the profession is very interested in fostering mentoring. Um, and we have been a career and a profession that goes back decades and even centuries as a very strongly mentored profession. It used to be that there were no graduate degrees in conservation. The programs in this country are, were born in 19 for so long. So the idea of mentoring um, is a long institution within conservation. And thinking about new ways to mentor and to see mentoring as a two-way relationship, not only from those of us who have you know, stood in this place for a while, but also that it is a partnership with those who are exploring it new. And that for me, I learn in both of those directions. Um, and to recognize your role in that is something that I think the field is also coming to do these opportunities to develop mentoring and to think about mentoring in new ways like partnerships that Caitlin mentioned and that you all have recognized in your own work. Um, so whatever it becomes, the opportunity to connect and to realize that mentoring is a strong part of, of what we do and an important, important, me, an important part of what you must learn in the field is how to be a mentee and how to be a mentor and to realize that Shannon said earlier you know, it can be a turning point to realize that you are you're, you're a teacher too. Um, and that, that happens to us at different moments throughout our careers. So what you've been invited to engage with at your tables and throughout today is something that hopefully will become a lifelong model of connecting and finding your role and your voice as a mentor and a mentee, and that we are the beginning of a community here that can help to support that. So um, keep the recommendation, follow up, and, and develop those connections, because that is what will forge your path, whether it's into conservation or something Thank you so much, Renee, and I, I, I can't tell you how much I think we all really appreciate the way that you framed, and I think each of you have, has framed um, the practice of mentorship. I'm just going to turn it this way so I'm doing it aside, but, um, but the practice of mentorship, that is uh, one being a two-way street, right? And it's, it's a, it's a two-way street. It's not just from the top down. Um, and, and it really has to continue to be a, a relationship that is massaged throughout. Um, and I know that as someone who has been mentoring students in art history and curatorial studies for some time, um, that it's really, really amazing when it goes in the other direction. It really is. Um, and we, we begin to do and learn new and different things. 
I, I also wanted to uh, maybe ask a quick question before we break to, uh, to gather our things and go across uh, to Clark. Um, but about, you mentioned uh, just now, Renee, that, um, that there were not uh, programs in conservation until about the 1970s. And it kind of makes me think about the field of um, photography. I had another question about, about, um, about thinking about provenance and if the work that you do as conservators ultimately goes into, say, the provenance of a work of art as it might be reported in, in an institution. Um, but my uh, training coming into this field of art history uh, came through my work as a photography curator and later appraiser of photography, and I worked frequently with conservators. But that field also didn't really come into being until the 1970s, más o menos the 1970s. That's when you could actually go and you. I actually had to apprentice, and you know, very happily so, with a photography appraiser to learn the field. Um, and then I would say maybe probably was sometime in the 90s, mid-90s, that there were programs where you could actually go to NYU, for example, and learn how to become a, an art appraiser. Yeah. So I, I was just wondering if there was maybe, there's, there's, there's a reason why these programs uh, maybe don't happen until sometime in the 70s, 80s, or 90s. And I'm just trying to think of what that, you know, what, what that has to do with um, how certain careers are professionalized. And I think it has a lot to do with the professionalization of the field. I think you want to say something, Shannon. Oh, you know, I was just going to say that um, uh, photography, of course, was not really even seen as an art form until the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that was kind of what I was thinking of when you were mentioning that. But I guess um, the way that conservation, it does have this long history, but it, it also has this of elitism and being a field where for some people it was more their husband or something, you know, someone was a member of the board of the museum and they needed something to do during the day, so go work in the conservation studio repairing artifacts. And so that's in a lot of ways how some people got into the field, but then obviously there's a need for it uh, and it's very important. So um, I think we're starting to get away from that that elitist model um, and making it a more equitable field. So, I think so too. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all again so very much. Um, if you would please, if you have anything on the tables, um, there are uh, receptacles outside of the doors. If you hung your coat, the coat rack is just as you walk out of the door. And you should have had um, maps, I think, somewhere. Is there a map? There are maps, I think, on the table. Um, but, but I'm happy to also leave the charge. Uh, we can walk leisurely across to the Clark Atlanta University Art Museum, um, where we'll be looking at the work of art or two. Okay, great. Okay, and, um, great. Thank you. And we'll be over there uh, for a start at 1.20 um, in, in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. 1.20. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.